And if you would, I'd like to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to Titus chapter 1. And if you do not have a sermon outline, I'd ask if you would to lift your hand and these gentlemen will take you out and ask you why you don't have one and question you, how did you get in here? We're going to find out where we fell down on our job. No, you need a sermon outline, especially this morning. This morning is, have you looked at it yet? It's what we call a four-pager. You know, we figured it's raining outside, it's Memorial Day, you're disappointed, and there's lunch over on the other side, so we're just going to spend the day. No, it actually won't quite be like that, but there, are, there, there is a reason that we have a four-pager this morning. Very often when we look at things from the Scripture that we've had different ideas on or confusion on, it is my conviction as your pastor, it is my conviction that you need to see it with your own two eyes. You need to be able to see what God's Word says, and I think it helps us so much when we do that. Um, maybe it's sometimes on moral issues that the culture around us is, is really wrong on it, and God's Word is right on it, and with the culture is powerful, so we need to really see what it says. Sometimes it's on personal holiness issues, just things down in our heart, and our, our heart is resisting God's, God's plan or God's way on something, and we need to see it clearly in the Scripture, so sometimes we'll look at a lot of Scripture then. Um, well, this morning we look at uh, the Scripture just because um, I believe that it's so helpful to us as we finish up this series within a series. We've been studying the book of Titus, but the first few verses in the t- book of Titus really deal with the leadership in the church. And we've said in our study, if you're new to us this morning, We've said in our study that many churches are very messed up and confused and, in fact, leaving the gospel. And as they leave the gospel, they they fall away from the truth because we've not been careful about our leadership. And so we see the need for that in this day and time, that the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be very careful about its leadership, would see it from God's perspective, not our culture perspective, maybe not even our traditional perspective or our denominational perspective or cultural Christianity, but we would see it from biblical Christianity as we come to it. Now, we've just given our offering this morning, and we've just come to another message here on leadership in the life of the church, and it kind of reminds me um, of a, a story that I heard from Arkansas when I was in Arkansas. Um, I went to one of the seminaries I went to was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I would drive across the river, um, the Mississippi River, and I would, I would go over and I would serve in Arkansas. And there was a church nearby that I, I just heard that a phone call came in one day to the church office, and a big kind of heavy voice was on there. He said, hello? Yes. Um, and the secretary said, hello, may I help you? And she, yes. I would like to speak with your pastor is the head hog at the trough nearby. (laughs) And she said, excuse me? He said, yes, is your pastor nearby, the head hog at the trough? And she said, how dare you refer to our pastor as a hog? I cannot believe you. We would never speak of him in this way. Well, fine, whatever, Uh, just leave him a message. I've come into some money and I'd like to write a check for $50,000 to the church. She said, hold on just a moment, sir. I see the big fat pig coming down the hallway right now. You know, sometimes we can be very pragmatic when it comes to issues of church leadership. We can become very, very pragmatic. We can become very influenced by things that are around us. And we want to be careful not to do that. We want to be careful to see what God's Word says and live out God's Word. And when a church does that, when a denomination does that, when we are very careful to pursue God's plan for His church, He pours out blessings that are truly supernatural. Um, I can tell you in the life of this church, as we as pastors and as we as the pastoral support team, the PST, and as, as deacons, as we have prayed for the church, as we have prayed that God would bring 
the bruised and the battered and the hurting, and he brings those. And sometimes when you are receiving the bruised and the battered and the hurting, you also, we, we, we pray, oh God, also bring those who are ready to help with this ministry. And do you know that God has done both? God has brought some. We prayed that there would be Saul's turn to Paul, and God has brought Saul's turn to Paul. And God has also brought young Timothys, and he's also brought um, godly young couples and godly middle-aged couples to come and help with the work. And so this morning we're reminded, and I want us to see, notice the title of the message um, as we wrap this up a little bit and then launch into the rest of Titus. But I want us to see this this morning, the biblical eldership, or you could put above, above that pastorate, the biblical pastorate or the biblical eldership. We've said over and over and over again that these two words are synonymous. The biblical pastorate or the biblical eldership, a wider scriptural perspective. Now, the picture is, what, why do I say wider? Because we've been looking at Titus. Have we looked at Titus? We have looked at Titus. We have looked at this very carefully, but this morning we're going to springboard off of this and we're going to see the wider biblical picture. And I think you're going to be blown away at how much this whole truth from Titus, verses 1, 5 through 9, just permeates the New Testament. It permeates the early church. It permeates the first century church. And so this is indeed a springboard for us. And remember with me, just to, you know, I only have two things of review here very quickly. Um, notice the brackets out there to the side. Verses 6 through 7, that was talking about what the pastor or what the elder must be. Must be. And the verses, verse 9 is what he must do. You can fill those two in. It's what the, he must be and it's what he must do. Um, and we, we, we just see this throughout the passage that's here. But look with me at first, or Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and we'll be reading it for the last time in this study. So I want us to see it. We've spent some great Sundays here um, over this time. But look with me and let it pour over you as I read. Verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order in what? And appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believing and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or, drunk or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Look at verse 9. And he must what? Hold firm to what? The trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And so the key reminder that is below this is that the terms pastor, elder, and overseer are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Circle that word interchangeably. There's a few places where there's some nuances that are a little bit different. There's no doubt about that. But by and large, we're not talking about different offices or different people. We're talking about the same people, the same role, and the same qualifications. Look at the next part there. They clearly represent the same office in the New Testament. And that same office is pastor, elder, or overseer. Now, I have a few questions that are here, and I want to answer them. I want you to be able to see them here, and then we're going to look at some passages from the rest of the Bible in such a way that you will be able to really see that these truths permeate through the Scripture. The first one is here, where do elders and pastors come from? I mean, certainly they're not born of a nor normal birth process and everything else. Aren't they that strange? Don't they come from some other planet? I mean, where do they come from? Where do these people come from? Whether in their, in their uprightness or in their non-uprightness, whatever you want, unrighteousness, where do they come from? Well, I want you to see this, and this is very clearly throughout the Scripture we see this idea, and you'll even see it this morning. Elders or pastors are provided by God to lead and to care for his flock, the church. 
elders are provided by God to lead and to care for His flock, the church. You may want to put a note out there to the side. They are not an invention of mankind. They are not an invention of sociology. They are not an invention of some necessity that the church has, and so the church found a solution. That is not at all the way God has designed or God has brought the church into being. I want you to see that much like the issue of marriage, you know, in this present day and time, one of Satan's lies about marriage is that this is a human invention. In case if somehow no one has shared this with you, marriage is God's idea. Marriage was God's design. This was his plan from the beginning. Male and female, he makes us, and beautifully he designs it where we can be a covenant people so that our marriage can show what kind of relationship he wants with us between heaven and earth. And so between husband and wife, we say that. So just as we did not invent marriage, we did not invent the pastorate or the eldership. We did not invent those who we call the episkopos uh, or the presbyteros or the poimen. All of these are the Greek idea of pastor, elder, or overseer. These are a gift from God to the church. Look at the next part that is here. What role do elders and pastors have? What purpose do they serve? What role do they have? What purpose do they serve? I want you to see this. Elders and pastors are given as faithful examples. The first part is, fill that in, faithful examples of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Now, it doesn't mean perfect examples. All you have to do is ask my wife or any of the people on our church staff. Um, They will tell you that the pastors in our church are not perfect, namely me. Um, We're not perfect people. Um, That is not the picture at all, but we are called to be faithful, and that means faithful to run to God's grace when we mess up. That means faithful to seek to live in such a way that we bring glory to Him and not shame to Him. That is the calling, and that is the requirement that we see here, and so pastors are called to be faithful examples first and foremost. Notice this with me. Elders or pastors' primary task is to hold firm. We just read this in verse 9. They're to hold firm to the trustworthy word so that they may diligently, faithfully teach God's people God's truth. That is the role of the pastor, is to faithfully teach God's people God's truth. Now, I want to say to you, A pastor may or may not be one of the greatest evangelists in the community. He may not be. In fact, there's very often where there's other church members that are even more effective evangelists, that are even more natural evangelists than their own pastor. The the goal is not for a pastor to be the star evangelist, church numerical, magnetic personality, church builder. That's not the picture. But if God's people are taught God's truth, God will raise up evangelists within the church. And when we think of evangelists, that's not a guy that flies around in a Learjet talking about how many thousand people came here and how many… I mean, I know you see that on television. But some of the most faithful evangelists have never spoken from a stage. Some of the most faithful evangelists are people who speak one-on-one to others about Jesus. And I'm not kidding. Those are the ones very often that lead more people to Christ, not because they have some position where they're expected to say it or some powerful personality, but simply because they are faithful to speak the words of the gospel to lost and dying people who, are needed, who need to hear it. And so the pastors are called to teach the truth and then certainly to be evangelists, no doubt about it, but we see that their primary calling is to teach God's people God's truth. Notice this. Elders and pastors 
also lead the church. They encourage the church. They correct the the individuals of the church. They protect the individuals in the church, and they are called to care for the church. So those, those key things, we see that throughout the Scripture. They are called to lead, encourage, correct, protect, and care for God's people. Um, notice the next part that is here. So that's, that's the overview of the role. But how are elders or pastors identified in the church? How do we know which ones are to be that? Well, the first thing that we want to recognize is that elders and pastors are called by the Holy Spirit. There has to be a calling by the Holy Spirit calling them to come and to fulfill that role. And they are also recognized by the church body. So there's some who say, well, I'm called, but there's no one that's recognizing. Um, I, I, let me just cause you to be aware that if there is a calling from the Holy Spirit, there is going to be a recognition from the body of Christ around them. Um, You see, and fill this in, this is both an inward calling as well as an outward calling. And what I mean by that is that a man knows when he's being called to be a pastor that God is putting something down inside of me that has not only this desire, but this beautiful, positive compulsion to do this. Not out of obligation, but out of a a sense that this is God's will, this is God's calling, this is God's leading in my life. It's interesting that some people gladly embrace that and others resist it. I hear, I've heard godly testimonies um, from both godly men um, and missionaries that have, said, that have given the testimony that I was resisting God's call. I was resisting God's call. And there's a lot of different reasons that someone may resist God's call. Um, sometimes it's out of fear. Sometimes it's out of, of concern that, that we wouldn't be able to fulfill what God is calling us to do. Can you think of some biblical examples of that? Think about Moses. Was he like, oh, thank you, Lord, yes, I'll be glad to help out. Is that what he said? No. He said, Lord, you can't mean me. I can't even... I, I, I can't even talk so good. How can, I, how can I lead people? He apparently had a speech impediment. And so he said, Aaron, let Aaron do it. <laughs> you know, but th- that, wasn't, that wasn't God's plan. And I mean, when, when, you, when you look through the New Testament and you look through the Old Testament, there were many other reluctant servants Now, we see that God, in His grace and in His work, works in the hearts of His servants, and He calls them to obedience, and oh, the privilege and the joy that they have to finally say, Lord, if you are speaking to me, I am listening, and I want to obey. You know, the greatest thing that we can do when we hear God calling is to not be a Jonah, and run the other way. You see, God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. He didn't even say anything. He just ran down to the shore and got on the next boat headed the opposite direction. Didn't even say no. Didn't even say, wait a minute, Lord, do you mean me? No, he knew and he ran. And there's sometimes when when people are running from God's call, and of course part of that was because Jonah was like, Those are my enemies, and you're just the kind of God that I'll preach to them your word, and they'll repent, and you'll save them instead of kill them. And, of course, that's exactly what God had in in mind. But nevertheless, God came after Jonah, and God used him. You see, there has to be an inward calling, but there also, as we see in the New Testament, there needs to be an outward calling. And that means that people around you 
affirm that and bring you along in that. Doesn't mean that it will be perfect. Doesn't mean that all of that will be nice and, and neat. Sometimes it's very difficult. But nevertheless, God works through that. Both of these, and you can fill that in, both of these must be present. The other way that pastors and elders are identified is that pastors and elders are identified that, because they, they must meet the qualifications that we've been studying. You see, this is one of the ways you know that this person may be called to serve God in the local church. He may be called to serve God in the local church if these things are in his life. So when you come across someone who looks like this and sounds like this, it's a reasonable question to say, hmm, I wonder if he's called to care for God's people. You see, and, and you say, well, what are those qualities? Well, where are those? Well, where are these two lists of these qualifications in the New Testament? Can you tell me? Okay, can we start at the top of the page in the box? Can you just write down Titus 1? We've just been studying it for like 10 weeks. So the first place where we see that list is in Titus 1. But the other prominent list that is almost identical to it is 1 Timothy 3. You remember a few weeks ago I had a grid on the page and there was a graphic that was there from the ESV study Bible that neatly shows that comparison of those two lists. But those two places are where we see just a, a very, very clear description. Now, let me remind you that, and you may want to put a note out there to decide, this is not a checklist. And in fact, it may not even be comprehensive. Um, th th this is a description of a man. This is a description of who he is. We know that there are other things that are mentioned that we see other qualities that are in the elders and the pastors um, in other places in the Scripture that maybe aren't specifically mentioned here. Um, but certainly we see this idea in, First Titus, or in Titus 1 and in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The last statement there on, under how our elders or pastors identified in the church is this. The elders and pastors of a church carefully evaluate and the congregation prayerfully confirms and affirms. So think about that with me. Elders and pastors, we see in the New Testament that elders and pastors, generally, they are the ones that look and see. They're discipling men in the church. They're discipling those that are here. They are, they are, they are called to protect the church. And so your, your body of elders, your body of pastors that are there leading in the church, as, as men come into the life of the church and either they grow up in the life of the church or they come to the church, there's just a constant process of simply saying, okay, we're, we're taking each person that God gives us as they come and we disciple them and we love them and we care for them. And, and as we do that, we are saying, Lord, how do you want to use each person in the life of the church? How do you want to use each one that is here? And sometimes pastors and elders begin to identify, well, is this brother, is this brother possibly called to be a pastor in the life of the church? So that, that is part of an evaluation process that, that a pastor and a pastor team does. But there's also the very important part of the congregation. You see, there's, it's not just a pastor-ruled congregation. That's not at all the case. The picture is, is that the congregation, all of us, and the pastors are part of the congregation, the congregation must pray together and confirm and affirm those whom God is raising up. This is how the church safely moves forward, saying, okay, 1 Timothy, we look at that. Titus, we look at that. 1 Peter, we look at that. We watch this man's life. We consider, we speak, we talk, we observe, we watch him serve. Time goes by. We're not in a hurry on it. And as time goes on, we see perhaps this young man developing or we see this new man come in, and we watch his life. And together, it becomes evident that either he is to lead 
or he is not to lead. And there's, there's been times in the life of the church, there's been times in ministry overseas where sometimes, you know, even as a missionary, um, I would especially have to really watch in that role very, very much. And there were some times when, when men did rise up and they were ready to lead, and that was such a joyful thing. And then there were other times when you kind of wondered and you kind of discipled and you say, well, you know what, that's just not as gifting. Or you know what, there's some areas in his life that aren't quite ready for that, and maybe, maybe, that's, not, maybe that's not best for him. Because you don't want to set him up to fail, and you don't want to hurt the church. And so we have to carefully evaluate and work through that. But here's the beautiful thing. God's calling both on the inside and God's calling on the outside is how this gift to the church is recognized, how it's identified. Well, how do elders and pastors, how are they organized in the church? Very general um, things that are here. I want you to see these. First of all, elders and pastors are always seen as a, fill this in, plurality of leadership. The passages that we're about to see, you're just going to see over and over again a lot of S's at the end of the words. They're, they're a plurality. It's not a single, in fact, there's not one place where we, there's not one place in all of the running around of Paul and of Peter and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark and everybody else, there's no example of a church with one elder, one pastor, no example of that. Everything that we see in the New Testament shows a group, a group of those that are there. And you see, this is, this is just the way God works and what He does in bringing together. We, we see it in the, in the um, nation of Israel as God would raise up the leaders in the, the Hebrew community and of the, is, the nation of Israel. We see God working through the elders in that setting. And then we see it also, to some degree, that idea being transferred over into the body of Christ um, in this, that there is a plurality of leadership. Look at the next part that is here. Elders or pastors may be, fill it in, vocational. That means full-time. That means this is their full-time career. This, that means that this is all about their preparation. This is all about their, where they spend all their days and all of their time, um, full-time. Or they may be what we call bivocational, and that simply means he kind of has two jobs, um, perhaps he's an engineer during the day, or he's a plumber during the day, but uh, during his other time, he's very, very committed and very devoted to the life of the church. And so, he, he has a career, or he has a job outside the church, but he also has a calling, and he has a role inside the church. Now, let me just be clear to you. The vast majority of pastors around the world are not the first category. The majority of most pastors around the world are either bivocational or the last one that is there, volunteers. And volunteer isn't necessarily the best word because all of them are volunteer. Hopefully, your full-time pastor is still a volunteer. He, he's not conscripted into the ministry. And in fact, First Peter deals with that. He says, I hope you're not serving out of compulsion. I had a conversation this week with a family member um, about a pastor in another part of the nation, so a, a faraway place. And as we were talking, and he was, he was talking about how the church was very much struggling, and there was a lot of things he didn't understand, and he was serving in that and, and trying to help the church. And the pastor is a vo bivocational pastor. And um, he was describing everything that kind of showed that the pastor's heart was not in what he was doing. And so as we talked around the lunch table, I said, what well, is he serving um, out of necessity or is he serving out of conviction? And this friend of mine said, that is a very good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Now, let me tell you, if it's not clear that as a pastor that he is serving out of conviction, he should not be a pastor. He has to serve out of the conviction of his heart. He can't serve because this is just a job opportunity. He can't serve because he can't do anything else. 
The, the only way that he should have the attitude of, I can't do anything else, it's because he knows before the Lord, I can't do anything else. I am compelled to do this by God's grace. Amen. When I was 20 years old and graduating from Florida State University, I walked down that aisle right there at the end of a worship service when Pastor Billingsley was giving the call um, and the call to serve God in the life of the church. And my father was standing at the end of that aisle. Um, and I, my dad said, Andrew, why are you coming forward? And I said, Dad, I know that God has called me to preach the gospel and to serve in the ministry. And my dad just looked at me and said, are you sure now, that's not the most encouraging thing that you, want to hear, that you hear from your own father when you tell him that you're called into the ministry. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. This is... And he said, well, son, if you can do anything else, you better go do it. If you can't do anything else, then perhaps you're called. And I knew at that point God had really been dealing with me, and I knew that I had no other desire but to say, Lord, I just want to do what you want me to do. I want to be your man. I want to teach. I want to preach your word. I want to be used of you. This is, the old, this is what I dream about. This is what I think about. This is what I'm convicted toward. And it's not because I want to do it to make a name for myself. I want to do it because I want to obey. And, um, I, you know, I, there was a long time there where I wanted to be a lawyer, a long time where I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But God changed all that and said, no, I have another thing for you to do. And it was there where I finally said, okay, I'm going to now tell my dad I feel compelled toward this. I want Sheridan Hills to pray for me. And Sheridan Hills began praying for this FSU student that God would define his call and work with his call. So that's part of the way that this works. Um, there's, there's also volunteers in the life of the church. These, these are men, perhaps, as I said, from anything, from um, any, any other uh, career where he supports himself, but yet he serves in the life of the church. And some of them, um, as they become more and more and more involved in the life of the church and as they serve, they, they are really juggling two major responsibilities in life. And so when you see, when you come across um, pastors or elders in the life of a church that are laymen serving somewhere else, and they're yet devoting all of this time and all of this energy and all of this time to counseling, and they're devoting this time to preparing to teach in one area of the church or another, it's, a, it's quite a task, and it's quite a calling, and it's a beautiful thing when you see God raising up men who say, yep, I know this is hard, I know I have another career, but I cannot deny what God is calling me to do. It's a beautiful thing, and the church is blessed by those who come and who serve in that way. Elders and pastors usually have, usually have equal authority but different responsibilities. And don't turn your sheet over yet. You may want to make a few notes here. We, we say usually have equal authority just because there, as a, a very young elder that's come into the life of the church that, that hasn't had very much experience yet, he, he's not yet had that much influence. And he's not yet there, but whereas somebody who's been in the ministry for quite a long time, the picture of the eldership is, is that they are equals before their, before their leadership, before the congregation, before the Lord, but they're going to have different levels of influence. There's no, there's no doubt of that. But here's the other thing that I want you to notice, that they come to have different responsibilities in the life of the church. And listen, this is how the church is well cared for that some are given to much teaching, some are given to much counsel, some are given 
to preaching. Some are given more to administrative leadership in the life of the church. Some are given to… There, there's several different ways in which pastors serve in the congregation. They're not all called to be the guy that's up front on Sunday morning. Sometimes they are leading and teaching in a, in a Sunday school class, or they're leading and teaching in the youth, or they're leading and they're teaching in other studies that are going on in the life of the church, or they're doing a lot of counseling and one-on-one -on -one discipleship and one-on-one -on -one mentoring, all of those, but as they do that, they are providing leadership as voices into the issues that are before the church in leading and ruling. And that's where you seek for the pastors to have an equal say and an equal playing field that they come together to say, how is God leading our church in this area? How is God leading our church in this area? What do we sense the Holy Spirit is leading us to do? When we speak with the people in the life of the church, when we listen to what they are thinking and what they are saying, how can we bring this before the church so the church can make an informed decision together and follow our leadership together and that they too can enter into important decisions? That's what pastors do. They lead and they work and they support in good leadership and good direction for the church so the church congregation can be increasingly involved following good leadership. That is what we see in the New Testament. Now, I want you to see on your, you can safely flip your sheet over, and I want you to just let your eyes look at this page. I want you to see, in fact, the next two pages. Notice that we start up there in Philippians, and then what comes after Philippians? What are we running to? Okay, most of you are there. We're looking at Philippians at the top, and then 1 Peter, and then look at this. There's several passages in Acts, and then we jump down there to the bottom to 1 Thessalonians, and then flip your sheet over. We gave this indication a little bit too. 1 Timothy is big on dealing with elders. Paul is writing to Timothy like Titus, and so there's a lot said to this idea of pastors and leadership in the life of the church. And then we see it down in James. You remember we studied the book of James, and as we studied the book of James, we, we said this about the book of James. Do you remember, was it toward the beginning of the planting of all the churches or of the first century, or was it toward the end of that? Okay, very good. Jose Torres. Ding, ding. You get the purple jelly bean. Here he is. Listen to this. The, we, we believe that the book of James was the first letter written and distributed to churches. So it was one of the early letters going out so, so that churches could know how to lead, how to rule, how to work in the life of the church. And then we see Hebrews that is there also. So go back and look at first, or Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. We see that there are two, chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that there are two offices in the life of the church, and at this very first verse in the book of Philippians from Paul, he writes, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, and look what it says, with the overseers and deacons, to all the saints, and the idea of with, you could put there, including or um, making clear that it's, it's, I'm talking to everybody. All of you are those who have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus. Now, the overseers and the deacons are these two offices, the only two offices in the church. The idea of pastor, overseer, as uh, uh, the overseer shepherd that is here, but also the deacons or the servants of the church helping take care of the congregation. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. He says, so I exhort, I've underlined these for you so you can see them, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock. That's the word poimen. That is actually the word pastor. You could write there, pastor the flock or shepherd the flock. Two words are synonymous. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising, and here's another key word, oversight. That comes from the word episkopos. 
uh, excuse me, presbyteros, which means bishop or overseer, the one who practices oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. See, he's not supposed to serve because he has to, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples. Do you see that? The, all of these other principles we saw on the other page, the, here they are coming out in these passages in First, first Peter. You, he says, being examples to the flock. Look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd or the chief pastor appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you are younger, excuse me, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now, that's an interesting thing in verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Young people, whether you like it or not, and I'm looking over here to a lot of our high school and college, um, the younger we are, kind of the more sometimes we, ha- we can have a temptation to resist authority or leadership. We haven't lived long enough to know this is the way it goes. We haven't lived long enough. And in fact, it's a little bit contorted because since about 1975, um, you know, we've seen billboards around the country and bumper stickers that say what? Question authority, <laughs> you know, stand up, rebel, protest, and everything else. That, that's become very much in vogue. And not, not that all of that is wrong. Some, we, we really should be careful to not blindly follow authority. But when that goes into revolutionary mode, it throws out all proper authority in thinking of submission in our lives. And instead, man simply says, I want to be king of myself. I don't want to submit to anyone or anything else. And so here Peter is saying, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. He's saying that that, that they're not going to hurt you. You need need to find your place of following their leadership. And then look what he says. I love this at the end of verse 5. He says, clothe yourselves. Circle it. All of you. Clothe yourselves. All of you with what? humility toward one another. You see, that's, that's everybody in the church should have a humble attitude toward one another. Every pastor, every young person, every deacon, every servant, every teacher, every, everyone who's, who's perhaps even hurting and can't, can't do anything to help in any way, but yet here we are all in the body of Christ, have humility toward one another, and then he quotes from the Old Testament, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So this shows and reveals the proper motivations and the attitudes of not only elders but also the whole church. Look at the next part, Acts chapter 11 and verse 30. And I've put in brackets here where some of these kind of come from, and you'll see Acts chapter 11 verse 30, the disciples sent financial aid to the believers in Judea, And look who carried the aid to the believers in Judea. In verse 30 it says, and they did so, sending it to the what? To the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So this is right after Saul gets saved, and the picture is is that they're sending this aid, and the elders that are in Judea during a famine, they receive that, and then they distribute that for the needs of those that are there, the believers who are struggling. And that was one of the roles of the elders, that they would, they would oversee that distribution, that they would oversee that picture. And, and really what we find in Acts 6 is they're handing some of that responsibility off as they, as they come in and they provide the leadership, they hand that responsibility off to the servants who can be careful, the, to the deacons who can be careful to distribute it evenly. Look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. The apostle Paul and others in Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And look what they do. And when they had pointed an elder, is that what it says? It doesn't say, and when they had pointed an elder in every church, it says, and when they had appointed what? Elders. Elders in what? Every church. So that's plurality of leaders. It's very clear throughout the New Testament. With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, Acts chapter 15 is a biggie. 
Acts chapter 15, and notice the small print that is there. The leadership of the apostles and the elders is seen at the Jerusalem Council, when, which seeks to settle the great controversy regarding accepting Gentile believers and issues surrounding the Jewish law. And this is specifically an issue of, eat, of eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols and circumcision and other things that had to do with the law. So here's the idea. You have Jewish people who've come to Jesus, and you have non-Jewish people who come to Jesus. The Jewish people, some of the Jewish people who came to Jesus, they wanted to make the non-Jewish people to become Jews first before they could really become Christians. And so there's a great controversy over all of this. You know, what, what are these Gentiles, how much of the law do they have to be subject to? And the part of the picture is here that we see who has to solve this controversy. It's the elders in the church that have to work through this issue. That's the point uh, that I want you to see from Acts chapter 15, verses 2, verses 4, verses 6, verses 22. You see that the apostles and the elders, the apostles and the elders, the apostles and the elders, and look at verse 22, with the whole church to choose men, and then, the, then they're choosing men to also um, take back a message to another group saying, this is who it is. So the whole church helped in sending off some men to go deliver a message about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate concerning Gentiles and the requirements of them. In Acts 20, um, in Acts 21, in 1 Thessalonians 5, over and over and over again, we see God working through the elders of the church to protect the church, to care for the church, and to grow the church as God wants to see them blessed. Flip the sheet and look at 1 Timothy. You remember with me, we noticed that there were two places where the qualifications are given. The first one is in Titus 1. The second one is in Titus 3. A couple of weeks ago, we read that passage. If you can, you can go back and you can read that passage and see that the qualifications are, are almost worded exactly the same. Um, and we see that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. But look down at 1 Timothy 4. I love this. And this is important for any pastor who is feeling called uh, anybody who is feeling called in this process. Look what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. It says, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep, and look at verse 16 and underline it, keywords for every elder, whether full-time or part-time or simply, uh, we would say, volunteer or um, a non-vocational elder. Look at verse 16. Keep a close watch on two things. What? On yourself and on your teaching. You see, this is what he does and what he says. This is, this is how he behaves because you see, an elder has to be an example, but he also is gifted in teaching. Persist in this, for in doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. This continues. Uh, Paul addresses numerous elder issues um, that has to do with the various levels of esteem and roles and pay and accusation and, and correction. I mean, there's several different things that are covered here. Um, should you pay a pastor? Well, if indeed this is his career and his vocation and he works hard at preaching and teaching, you should pay him. And in fact, those who work hard at preaching and teaching, you, you should pay them um, significantly more than you pay the person who simply does counseling, perhaps, perhaps other things that's perhaps not as demanding of their time and their calling because those things are difficult and take much. You don't want him worried in thinking about those things. And so we, we come to this to see that there's different roles and there's different things even within the eldership. Look at verse 17 um, down there at the bottom. It says, some pastors, fill these in, some pastors teach a lot, some teach a little. Fill that in. Those who rule well or exercise authority should be honored more. 
is what it says up in verse 17. Those who rule well and work hard at teaching should be paid well, is what it says. It says it very clearly. Look at Acts, and it's weird for me to say that. It would be so much easier to have a layman teach that and, and say that than the pastor having to say that. But I'm committed to teaching you the Bible, so I really don't care. And I, I mean, we, we seek to do that correctly. And I'm very grateful for the, the opportunity to serve in this way and the opportunity to um, lead in this way. But there's other pastors here, too, that... that also um, lead and serve in these ways as well. Um, but notice here with me in verse 18, uh, the note that is here. It says, uh, Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4. He's talking about the ox. And, and it's interesting, in that passage, it's saying, if the ox is leading the grinding thresher or the, the, the grinding wheel that's there, he is to, you're to allow the ox to eat what he is grinding. And so that keeps the ox going. So I don't know what, Paul, what point Paul is making by comparing us to oxes. But I guess, I guess there's, some, there's some aspect of that in which, um, you know, you, you can say dumb as an ox or whatever. But anyways, um, the, the picture is, is that it's appropriate to take care of their needs and to uh, help them in that way. Look at verse 19 um, down there. The, this is how to charge an elder. I want you to notice that elders are not perfect, and sometimes elders are sinful. Look at verse 19 in that text. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. You say, that doesn't sound very Christian. Oh, yes, it does. It may be hard. You know, there's a lot of things in the Christian life that are hard truths, but this is how we stay on the straight and narrow way. You see, in rebuking a man in his sin, that is a merciful thing to do. When we rebuke someone, the point is not to shame them and put them down. When you are rebuked, the point is to draw that brother to the truth. Draw that brother to repentance. Draw that brother to living what is right, to turn from his sin and to do what is right. And it's also to protect the flock so that others also will see, wow, that is unacceptable. And so you see that in verse 19 and 20. Look at verse 21. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging. Do nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in laying on of hands nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. These are beautiful statements about how, to Timothy about how for uh, the, the eldership or the pastors in the church can be kept in a pure and helpful way. Look at verse 22. It says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Here's part of verse 22. Go slow in making an elder an elder. You don't need to be in a hurry about that, but you do need to be sure. You do need to be as certain as possible um, that his life is right and that his calling is there. Now, James chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 13 are beautiful. Both of them are there. I want to skip down to Hebrews chapter 13, and I want you to see this. Here's another strange one for me to preach and to preach very hard. But look with me at verse thir in chapter 13 and verse 17 of Hebrews. Obey your leaders and, to su and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. You see, part of the picture here, look, it is true that all of us have a, have a nature within ourselves and in our, our, our self that we, we don't want to submit ourselves. We don't want to submit ourselves to God. We don't want to submit ourselves to brothers and sisters around us. We don't want to submit, our, submit ourselves to the body of the church. And we don't want to submit ourselves. Some, look, 
I am 50 years old, and Clell Coleman still pulls me off to the side sometimes to say, now, Andrew, I want to talk to you about something. I'm 50 years old and a pastor, and Clell Coleman still does that. And do you know that I still have to fight that little thing that goes, oh. Do some of you feel that way? Do some of you know what I'm talking about? It's not like I just humbly, oh, Dad, speak, speak. You know, just tell me what, everything you think. I don't just naturally do that all the time. There's a lot of times I'll do that. I mean, there's a lot of times I'll say, oh, yeah, Dad, what do you think? But sometimes I kind of know what he's going to say or, you know, because maybe I've heard it 30 times before or, you know, I, I don't know. But, but there's sometimes when he's, he's coming and that little thing wells up in me. Well, let me tell you, a wise man receives instruction. A wise man listens to counsel. A wise man recognize the, recognizes that Proverbs says that the wounds of a friend are faithful wounds. They're good wounds. And so as we, as we come and as we look and as we see this picture of authority within the life of the church, and whether it's elders, listen, whether it's elders submitting to the body of the church, because we are a congregationally ruled church. That as time goes on, you know, we want to increase more and more and more the, the congregation's involvement and a ability on appropriate matters to, as a church, listen to God and obey God together, make decisions together. That is what we see in the Scripture, but also letting the leaders lead. There's this beautiful, healthy relationship that can be there that is very safe for the church. And so that's what we see. Now, now I know that we have many examples in our head from years gone by, maybe decades after decades, um, sometimes where all of that's not been done in a very godly way. Some of you have been in churches where uh, every time the church came together to work on something or to decide something, it turned into a fight. You, I mean, somebody told me this week that they came from a background where, you know, they, they were just certain two guys were going to go to blows in a church meeting. And praise God that we're a million miles from that. Here when there's, when there's disagreement, which there is sometimes, there's, you, there's the ability to sit down and, and to talk and work and pray and and be godly in the way we deal with it, and either come up with a better solution or agree to disagree. And so, this is the picture of Christ. And here it says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, as those who will give an account. You see, they're going to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. It's not a, it's not a good thing. I want you to fill these things in, and we're done. Notice that all Christians, both the congregation and the elders, are accountable. All Christians are accountable. There's no such thing as the rogue congregation or the rogue group of elders or rogue pastor. Also notice this, obedience and submission bring blessings. Obedience and submission brings blessings blessings. God is the greatest blesser as we submit to Him and as we turn to Him. Now, I do want you to notice the back page. I know you're folding that thing over and you're putting it away, but I, and that's okay, but I want you to notice the back page. Our bookstore has some great books on this, and here's, here's some of the reasons that you ought to… some of you need to go buy one of these books. Some of you are feeling called by God to serve in the life of the church, or, or, or you think that that may be the case. And young men, I just want to say to you, you need to ask God, God, are you working in my heart on this? Have you given me this, this concern? Have you given me this compulsion? Um, I want to say to you that that's not a bad thing. That can be a good thing. Now, others will help you work through your motives on that and help you work that out. 
But there's, a, there's some great books that are here, and the very first one in the upper left-hand corner is Biblical Eldership. And I'll say to you that when I was in seminary, I found that book, and I said, that looks like what the Bible says more than anything else I've seen. Um, as I would see churches that were unhealthy, as I would see churches that didn't have accountability, as I saw churches that were carnal and very broken, I thought, man, that's not healthy, that's not good. But when I began to read Alexander Strauch, I began to say, wow, why isn't this guy more broadly known? Now he is. But at the time, he wasn't. And he wrote some great material on it that I want to encourage you. And some of the books are very thick and some of them are very small. In fact, we have the synopsis of some of his books. Um, and, uh, and by the way, these are mine up here, so don't anybody run off with mine. I'm very protective. Just kidding. Um, of my books. You know, pastors and their books. But um, there's all kinds of great resources in the, li- in, the, in the bookstore for you to look at that. Or maybe as a church member, you're saying, I want to learn more about um, how, this, how this works and what it looks. John MacArthur has written two great little tiny booklets, um, in, and they're in the bookstore as well. One of them called Elders, and another one um, that is called Deacons, um, and Understanding Deacons and Key Questions. Um, so there's just great resources on this. There's no excuse for us not to increasingly say, how can we be as a church more and more and more godly in what God has called us to do? Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we go.